Welcome to the world of water. So it's time for us to uh, sit back and think about water, all the ways we use it, how wonderful it is, uh, all the way from the water in the womb of our mother uh, to the water that we use to wash with, the uh, water of baptism, the water that we use to cleanse ourselves, and the way God cleanses our earth. Earth is a amazing place. It's been around for some three billion years, and it stays clean uh, for the most part. We have done a, a job on uh, polluting it, but it um, has a, an amazing in, uh, automatic cleaning system. So one of the ways in which the Earth cleans itself is to evaporate the water from our oceans and that's carried up into the air and it condenses in the clouds and then comes back down as rain. Rain uh, essentially is distilled water and that distilled water cleans the surface of the earth. So it's like the earth washes its face with rain water. I can remember as a child we used to run out in the rain and we loved it. Uh, we'd go out in our underwear and run around and we'd open our mouth and let the rain come in and uh, we loved the rain. The uh, second way that the earth cleans itself is through the soil and the, uh, the under layers of our earth. The, uh, and when you put contaminated material on the surface of the earth, say uh, using fertilizer manure in, in the farmlands, That goes down through the very various layers of earth and it forms chemical bonds as it goes down with the different substances that are in the earth. By the time it gets down to the deep groundwater aquifers, these are like underground rivers and and underground uh, containers of water, which is what we call the aquifers, it's pretty clean. It's so that the cl very clean water is in the deep ground water. Then there's a third way that the earth cleans itself, and that is in the deep ocean. And the bottom of the ocean there are what are called upwellings. They're like spouts that move the water from the deep ocean up to the higher levels. So it basically provides clean water for the plankton. The plankton is the base of our food web, and the plankton are living creatures in the ocean, in the uh, seawaters, and they feed the small fish, and the small fish feed the medium-sized fish, and the medium-sized fish feed the big fish. It's uh, all a part of a food web, and it's the basis of human food because many of the um, 
of the land vegetables and fruits. They need water, and many of the animals uh, either drink water directly or they consume fish. So uh, it's all connected. The whole uh, of life is connected, and we are near the top of the chain, so we're the most dependent of all of the uh, creatures on the planet. Everything that's alive is called part of the biomass of the planet. Biomass just includes trees and grass and bushes and flowers and birds, animals and humans. Also all the fish and the uh, the seaweed and the, uh, the huge whales, as well as the very small uh, minnows. So everything is biomass. Ninety percent of the biomass of the planet is in the oceans. That's kind of amazing because uh, what you see around you and what's on the surface of the earth as land and, and living species on the land is really only 10% of what's on our planet. The planet has this uh, biosphere, which is the living level. It, ta it goes down under the earth a short way, and then it goes all the way up through the water part of the atmosphere, all the way up to the stratosphere. There's not much water in the stratosphere, uh, but the lower part of the, uh, of the atmosphere of the Earth has water in it. And so we have birds up there and we have other living creatures. So biosphere covers the lower part of the atmosphere plus into the ground of the planet uh, to some depth where there are things like uh, worms and snakes and little animals that burrow into the ground. And this is the living part of the earth. Water is essential for all life. We don't have life without water. That's why there was such excitement when they found water in Mars, because it says at some point in the past they might have had life forms there. Uh, if the planet has no water, then there's no life as we know it, unless there's some other kind of life that um, we have no idea of. When we look at the water, we say, uh, what have what have humans been doing to this water system, which has really lasted for uh, millennia, for um, so many years, and stayed clean? So that you know, we have things like springs that come up clean, beautiful. Uh, what what have we been doing? Well. Uh, I think a lot of the problem has stemmed from the uh, Industrial Revolution and also from uh, workers trying to clean up the uh, problems in the factory. The uh, workers were on the front line of any kind of production, which was kept into a closed factory building. And they would be in the factory building eight hours a day uh, for five days a week. And so you could measure the pollutant in the factory and then you could uh, take people's rate of breathing and we'd get some idea of the, the dose of the hazard that they received. 
and you you could make an estimate of their health effects or you could even see their health effects because they were getting sick. Now, in order to clean up the problem in the factory, which was really killing the workers, uh, they found ways to get rid of these hazard materials, hazardous materials. And one way is to send it up the stack into the air. Well, uh, then the wind takes it away, but doesn't disappear it. It just moves it to someone else's backyard. So it started spreading these pollutants into the air, and they would get into the clouds, the same as the uh, evaporating rain gets into the clouds, and then it starts coming down with the rain. So that was what we did to the system for cleaning the earth, cleaning the surface of the earth. The main pollution in our uh, atmosphere that pollutes our, our rain uh, started with the atmospheric nuclear testing. There were so many nuclear tests done in the atmosphere around the world that we raised this radioactive debris up to the stratosphere and then it drops down to the troposphere and it comes down with the rain. So this has been a major source. Another uh, thing that's of concern is fluoride, and uh, the organization which I started in Toronto has been very active in trying to stop people from putting fluoride into their drinking water. Uh, it was really based on false research. Fluoride is a byproduct of the nuclear industry, which produces uranium hexafluoride in order to enrich the uranium. So the nuclear industry was polluting with fluoride and had a whole program of uh, co to convince people that fluoride was okay. And uh, they convinced the dental profession that it was good for uh, preventing cavities. And so people started putting it in their water supply. It's quite dangerous for children, especially under the age of five. And they're showing up now with even brown mottling on their teeth. So uh, this is not a, a good practice. And I would congratulate the head of the dental school at the University of Toronto, who publicly apologized to people for having promoted fluoride. Uh, because he realized that this was even bogus research it was based on. There are other uh, inorganic substances in our water, and we do need to protect ourselves from them. And we also have the deep aquifers under the earth where the water is relatively clean because the pollutants have come off at different levels as they were sifted through the ground and they connect with the, um, with the various metals and uh, minerals that are in the ground and they make a chemical connection so they don't go through all the way to the groundwater, the deep aquifers. But we've been putting hazardous materials into landfills uh, that just don't do that. They don't uh, react chemically with the um, ground, with the ground, with the minerals and metals in the ground. So these hazardous materials are getting into our groundwater, uh, and that's another second problem. And the third problem is the toxic materials that have been deliberately dumped in our oceans. Uh, there's an incredible amount comes from direct dumping, but also uh, from things like uh, nuclear-powered 
uh, military vessels and submarines or diesel-powered uh, trade vessels or cruise ships or whatever that uh, are going around in our water supply and are releasing petroleum products or uh, other kinds of toxic materials. So we have pretty well messed up the three cleaning systems for our planet. Native people look at society and they say, who, who is most independent? And they say, well, the earth doesn't need the flowers and the plants and the vegetables and the trees. It could still exist. Therefore, Mother Earth is the most important. The trees and the plants, they make their own food. They don't need to have outside food. They have photosynthesis. They didn't call that, but they knew that they could sustain themselves without the animals, uh, except some that need to be um, fertilized with the bees and so on. But uh, generally, the earth could be pretty fruitful without any animals. And then you start looking at the animals. Well, you come up with humans as the most dependent of all the creatures on the earth, so you get a you get a different power structure. You get Mother Earth as this is this will survive. This is sustainable. You have to be respectful of Mother Earth. You have to be respectful of the plants and the trees. You have to be respectful of the animals. And you, you do take what you need for food, but you don't sell it or exploit it. You don't cut down trees in order to make money. Uh, you don't uh, exploit the animals for their fur so you can make fur coats. You know, it's a, it's a, different, it's a different attitude toward nature. Than, uh, than the common Western attitude. One of the native elders said to me is they thought that the difference between white people and indigenous people was that indigenous people could live in the midst of plenty and not exploit it, and that it was too much of a temptation for white people. We overdo our um, exploitation of resources. So let's look at how much water we have and how it's distributed and how much water we have for things like drinking and bathing. In order to uh, get some idea of how much water there is in the world, if you imagine a yardstick, most people know how, at least have an idea how big it is, a yardstick is about the same size as a meter stick. A meter stick is just slightly bigger than a yardstick. Uh, and if you, you know, we have a word for a thousand meters, we call it a kilometer or kilometer but we don't have a word for a thousand yards. So uh, what we do is measure water in cubic kilometers. So if you can imagine a thousand yardsticks and a cube, which is, has a thousand yardsticks on each side, height, width, and depth, then you know what a cubic kilometer looks like. In the total global water, we have 1.4 billion cubic kilometers. That's, that's how much water is on our planet. This has been estimated now using satellites. Most of that, in fact, 97.5% is salt water. It's in our oceans, and uh, we have some salt 
uh, lakes, like Salt Lake City, is on a salt lake. Only 2.5 percent of that global water supply is fresh water, or sweet water, or unsalted water. I want to take that 2.5 percent of the global water and say, where is all of the fresh water? Well, it seems that uh, almost 69% of it is in glaciers. And the glaciers have always been a water reservoir for the world. It's like, our, uh, it's like having a supply of oil for an emergency. Glaciers are our emergency water supply for the, uh, all the living things on the planet. Another 30% of the fresh water is our deep ground water, and that's the deep aquifers that we were talking about before. Another 1% uh, is in uh, ice and permafrost. This is kind of permanent ground ice, both at the North Pole and the South Pole, the Arctic and the Antarctic. That's uh, permanent ice and what's called permafrost. Less than 1% uh, of this water is available to us uh, as like drinking water, washing water. Our lakes have about 0.3%. The atmosphere has only 4 tenths of 1%. The uh, wetlands hold about 0.03% of the water. The rivers hold almost nothing, 0.006%. The plants and animals, uh, we have water inside our bodies. About 70% of the human body is water, and that's 0.008% of the water although we have 6.5 billion people on the planet. So there's a lot of water on our planet, uh, but it won't absorb everything we do to it. We're blessed with 20% of the freshwater lakes in the world in our Great Lakes. The Great Lakes system is a very precious uh, heritage in the United States and Canada. It's shared equally between the two countries. Another 20% of the freshwater lakes are in Russia, but their freshwater lake is fed by a spring. So uh, there's an underground spring that keeps renewing their, their 20% of the water. Our 20% of the water comes from the glacial ages. So it uh, was cut into the earth by glaciers and it's glacial fresh water. Only about 1% of the water in the Great Lakes can be repli replaced by rain. If we take water out of the Great Lakes as uh, Coca-Cola is now planning to do in Lake Michigan, it won't be replaced. So you can't take unlimited amounts out of the Great Lakes uh, just because it can't be replaced by the, um, by the uh, rain. So the, we have to respect the way the lakes are created. Industrial um, output, the uh, use of diesel, fuel, the uh, burning of oil, the burning of coal, all of that puts um, pollution into our rainwater, which is supposed to be distilled water and, and really beautiful water. Uh, our underground contaminants have it's been growing, and it's getting down now into the deep aquifers. And there are some things that are uh, really uh, of worry because uh, volatile organic substances, these are 
substances which, uh, when you run your shower water or your kitchen water, they can float out into the room and you can breathe them, and they're very toxic. They cause cancer. And those are getting into our deep, deepest aquifers. So volatile organic products now can be measured in most people's bathrooms and kitchens because they come in with the water. Uh, our metals, heavy metals, and even uh, oddly uh, formed metals because of some kind of industrial process can get into the water and come out, gets into our drinking water. 43 states, their deep aquifers have pesticide in them now. So the pesticide apparently is not trapped in the soil as it goes down to the deep water. So we have pesticides in it. Some, there's salinity sa salt in some of the deep aquifers, and they're supposed to be pure water. They're supposed to be water that has lost its salt. Arsenic is a substance that goes through the uh, system unchanged, and 28 of our states have arsenic in their drinking water. And other agricultural chemicals, especially things that are being sprayed on crops, added as fertilizer, these are getting into the river water, therefore the ocean water, and also the deep aquifers. There are three companies now that are, are bottling water. It's Coke, Pepsi, and Nestle's. They are taking water from irrigation, from farms, especially in the third world. There's competition between the people who want to bottle the water and the people who want to use the water to raise food. So it's a, I mean, what do you want, food or water? It's a pretty tough choice. But, you know, this is becoming a $100 billion a year industry globally. Uh, meanwhile, the World Health Organization has been trying to get water for the 2 billion people in the world that uh, don't, don't have water. They don't have clean water. And they don't have water for sanitary purposes. They don't have drinking water. It would take $33 billion, which is about a third of the cost, that's be, the money that's being spent on bottled water, just a third of that would be enough to uh, drop the number of people without water by 50 percent. So this, I mean, this is um, what we would like to do and what you could help with doing is to reduce the use of bottled water and demand that the public water supply be cleaned up. Uh, it affects especially the poor because they can't afford to buy uh, bottled water, and it's a, it's a huge international problem. Making money on water. Water is something God-given right. We have a, a natural a human right to water, and animals and plants have a right to water. So selling it is, to me, uh, reprehensible. I think it goes counter to the rhythm of the earth, which has been so generous in providing us with water. We do try to avoid bottled water whenever we can. And we do try to use political pressure on our government to, uh, first of all, don't put toxic things in the water and uh, clean up the water supply and delivery to everybody, not just to the people who can afford bottled water.
we discovered that there were five large rivers in the northern hemisphere and another five in the southern hemisphere. And these are like vapor rivers. And they're about three miles up from the level of the earth. And they take the water from the uh, rainforest in the tropics and then they move it up into the uh, northern and southern hemispheres. And there's a whole uh, circulation. These are, these are the great rivers, and actually from satellite you can see them. Uh, when they had the um, Mississippi River flood, if you remember, it was pretty awful there for, for quite a while. One of the major rivers, which is just off the east coast, had moved inland and was uh, just about over the Mississippi River, and that was when that awful uh, flooding occurred. But uh, we ha have now uh, the technology, the military has the technology, to control to some extent both rain and drought. I would say the biggest pollution in the industrial sector is the military production because they're deliberately producing atomic biological and chemical warfare. They're deliberately producing materials that will kill people and animals and plants. You know, this goes into our naturally recycling Earth. If we could get peace on this planet, we would also have clean water on our planet. And uh, we could clean up our domestic production. We don't have to use toxic materials. Sometimes they're cheaper, and so they use them because they're cheaper. But with some pressure from the public, we could clean up our uh, planet and our water supply. Uh, peace is very much a part of, of living on the planet instead of fighting upon the planet. When we look at what are the competing uses of water, I know it's sometimes said that there's too many people on the planet and they take all the water. Well, that's not true. In the uh, whole global situation, only 8% of the water, of the fresh water globally, is used by people. which is a kind of shocking thing because, uh, you know, our intuition tells us people are using all the water. They're not. <laughs> and that's 8% across the board. In low and mid-income countries, they really stick to the 8%. But the few people that live in high-income and high-industrialized countries are using about 11%. So even in the first world, uh, the amount of water being used by people is quite small compared to the amounts used by uh, the other comp competition for water. In the uh, whole world, 70% of the water goes to uh, the agriculture. It goes to producing food and crops and feeding the uh, animals. 22% of the world's fresh water is going to industry. But the uh, 
the way that's balanced in the low and middle income countries against the highly industrialized countries is very startling. Only 10% of the water is going to industry in the poor countries and the middle income countries. When you get to the high industrialized countries, it's 59% is going to industry. So industry is the major use a user of water in the United States and Europe, for example. They're taking 60% of the water and the people are taking 11%, and agriculture is taking 30%. So, uh, you know, there's, there's something going on here. We're not really competing with people for water. We're competing with industry. And industry pollutes the water that it takes because it's... Uh, it takes it into its processing, picks up waste, and then it's, uh, it's uh, affluent to our rivers and our lakes, and, or even uh, they do deep well injections into the groundwater. So <clears throat> industry is the major polluter of water. I think the only uh, way to go, the only uh, viable future for our planet is to demand clean production. Very often they could produce the same uh, end products for us to use, uh, but they could use different materials that are not hazardous or not toxic, and that would be compatible with the system for cleaning the water, which is naturally in place on our planet. Our mother house water is, I think it's about 1,500 feet deep. So uh, we were very fortunate when we built uh, to have a deep well that went into an underground river. And it has uh, provided water for all five buildings at the mother house for the last 41 years. And it's good water. Uh, it's tested regularly. Even the most modern water purification system cannot remove things that we've been putting into the water. So uh, pesticides, for example, are not removed in a water uh, purification system. For example, when you have um, a, a dump, uh, a, a landfill, that is like a small chemistry lab and all kinds of things happen in a landfill because you're mixing all the chemicals you put in and there's also heat because uh, other things are fermenting so you've got heat and you've got chemicals and you get chemical reactions so you get this very toxic leachate coming out of a, a, a landfill and this is both domestic landfill and hazardous waste landfills. So what they do is collect this leachate and uh, direct it to the municipal water supply. And the municipal water supply can't clean these um, various chemicals out of the water. So uh, that's why people use at the tap water end, that's why you use... Uh, some method to filter your water. Uh, but you could demand an, uh, that, the, uh, that the purification system be improved, and you could also demand that toxic chemicals not be used and not be just dumped into landfills. So, uh, it, it, you know, this question is a big one, and it requires civic action as well as personal action. Water is such a precious gift. It's something wonderful that is part of our planet and that we need to protect. So uh, we need to really think about that. There are other things besides chemical pollution that also affect water. And remember, our, our human body is 70% uh, water. So if it affects 
water that's outside of the body. It also affects water inside of the body. And that's uh, things you might not have thought about, like electrical currents, uh, cell towers, TVs, uh, cell phones, uh, you name it. Uh, blackberries, uh, little game uh, devices, and even what's being built now are uh, wireless city centers where uh, everything that's electric will work without being plugged in. Uh, that means that they're filling the city center with electromagnetic radiation. Now we get electromagnetic radiation from the sun so we, it's part of life, and it supports life. But what you get from the sun is broadband. It's a broadband radiation. It does everything from cosmic rays to visible light to radio waves to extra low frequencies. So you get this broad uh, electromagnetic radiation uh, coming in from the sun the particles that are in it are picked up by our outer Van Allen belts and uh, our electrojet. These are out, outside protections of the planet for whatever is coming from the cosmos and for some of the harmful things that come from our sun. And then we have our ozone layer, which stops some of the ultraviolet light which can be hurtful to living things. So we have a very beautifully designed planet which allows the life-supporting rays to come through and stops the rays that are harmful. Uh, and we seem to be also destroying our ozone layer, uh, which is protecting us from the ultraviolet rays. In the spring of 2003, the People's Health Assembly, which was uh, an organization I had I participated in the foundation of, and it was uh, public health workers from 92 different countries, mostly third world countries. And we met in Bangladesh and they uh, aired their problems, the problems of uh, based on the economy, the uh, structural changes being demanded by the World Bank and uh, other kinds of outside pressures that were making it difficult to uh, improve the health, especially in the poor countries. But the second problem that they identified as uh, seriously affecting health was the water shortage and the water pollution. About 42,000 people die every day uh, from waterborne diseases, diarrhea, uh, or lack of water uh, in areas that have a drought. Uh, and that's an awful lot of people in the course of a year. This is a daily number. So um, water is a huge problem. Their second victory was also accomplished in 2003, and that was the declaration by the World Health Organization that water is a human right. Now, uh, water is included as a human right in the human right covenants that were 1947 that we hear a lot about, but those covenants uh, included political rights, rights of uh, to vote, right to assembly. They also have economic and social rights. Now, the uh, United States has only signed the political rights, the, uh, the first part of the uh, human rights covenant. But in the second part of the covenant are the uh, social and economic rights, and the United States has never signed that. And among that, they picked out the right to water as a human right uh, to stress. Now, uh, if they can get enough countries to sign in on this 
um, resolution of the World Health Organization, this can become international law, which would then put pressure on each nation to make sure that the uh, individual has uh, both drinking water and bathing water and sanitary water. And uh, this would be an obligation of a country. Water is uh, in crisis around the world. One place is our own southwest. Even in desert areas, they're trying to grow green grass, plant things, or they're taking the ir water for irrigation for golf courses and for many other uh, reasons, but they're taking it away from the uh, indigenous people who have uh, who, who live on the land and who have every right to the water for drinking and bathing and sanitary purposes. And they're also uh, depleting the uh, big rivers in the Southwest. Water is, is going to be the next item for international wars. Uh, we're having wars over oil now, but water is probably the next one. Uh, just to give you a few samplings around the world, the um, uh, Palestinians in the Gaza Strip, they take the end, they're in the end of the river after it goes through uh, the Israeli part, and it's often full of pesticides and a lot of industrial pollution. And so when they get the water, they're downstream just before it goes into the Mediterranean. It's uh, at a very uh, dangerous level of pollution. There's also uh, tension between Israel and Syria over water rights. In the uh, Asia, water is very scarce, and that's where the industrial uh, companies are moving. Uh, the United States has been moving their industries into Asia, where they have uh, technically trained cheap labor. They don't have the pollution laws in place, and they don't have uh, people organized to complain about the uh, polluting companies. And so they are moving in to uh, China, to Malaysia, to um, India, and these countries are short of water to start with. So they're taking the water for industry. They're also uh, having uh, the bottling industries moving in. There's no rational management of our water supply, and it's rapidly being privatized just for greed. There's no reason people have to have Pepsi-Cola or Coca-Cola, for example. It's not a human right, but drinking water is a human right. So, uh, and it should be free. It's like the sunshine. It comes with our earth, and everybody's entitled to it. As soon as they privatize, they sell it to you. Someone has calculated that the cost of bottled water relative to water that comes out of your faucet is a, it's a thousand times more costly than water that is piped into the house. So uh, that very quickly eliminates the poor from clean water. So uh, this is uh, unacceptable in any society. Uh, you can't just rule people out because they don't have money. In uh, 1972, U.S. and Canada signed a water agreement for border waters. This would cover the Great Lakes, the St. Lawrence River, the Red River, the um, Columbia River out the west coast, and uh, any, any rivers that are shared or lakes that are shared. Uh, I served on the Science Advisory Board for the Great Lakes for several years, and uh, we identified uh, areas of concern on both sides of the border that needed cleanup, and then 
locally, uh, the communities worked on those um, problems, things like the Hamilton Harbor or uh, the West Valley effluence that goes into Lake Erie. So there's a lot of places that are, are labeled areas of concern around the Great Lakes. And people have been trying to clean them up. And uh, so there's been a, it's been a learning experience, not as fast as you would like it to be, but uh, there's been a watershed approach where all the water is feeding into the lakes are looked at and all of the industries that are dumping into the waters that feed into the lakes are looked at. Uh, the lakes are a very special case because it's like a, it's like your sink with the stop always closed. So you can just imagine what accumulates in a large lake like that with people dumping in and it accumulating and how long it takes to get rid of it. Uh, some lakes will uh, change faster, like Lake Erie changes faster because it's not so deep. But, and Lake Ontario is a very deep lake. It's another one that's slow changing. So uh, lakes are not rivers. Changing the water in a lake is tricky and it takes a long time. Most of the Great Lakes have a counterclockwise uh, motion. There's no way out of a lake, and the lakes take a long time to empty. For example, I think it's Lake Superior takes 150 years to change water in them. So they circulate the uh, whatever is dumped. For example, in Canada, will come around to the U.S. side, and whatever is dumped in the U.S. side goes out the uh, St. Lawrence River. The Niagara Falls is a barrier along the lake system, and there are two different kinds of water ecosystems above the falls and below the falls. In uh, Lake Ontario, you get some influence from the ocean uh, through the St. Lawrence Waterway, and you get some species in the um, Lake Ontario that you don't get beyond Niagara Falls. After I was on the Science Advisory Board for the Great Lakes, I was asked to serve on the Nuclear Task Force, which would take care of radioactive pollution of all of the rivers. Uh, and there are rivers that are joint with Canada uh, right across the U.S.-Canada lower boundary, but also up in Alaska. So there's a, it's a rather big mandate. However, we found that uh, neither country, U.S. or Canada, were going to uh, respond to what we found in terms of the radioactive pollution of the waterways. The, it's the International Commission on Radiological Protection, which uh, recommends standards for water, for soil, for uh, radiation protection, in quotes, uh, for the, what workers can be exposed to, what the public can be exposed to, what's in your drinking water. And uh, they make these recommendations and they're pretty well adopted by all the countries in the world. So you're not just dealing with two countries. You're trying to deal with the, an international self-appointed group that makes these decisions. Uh, so it's uh, much more difficult to try to deal with the radionuclides in the water system than it is the chemicals. That's why you hear more about the chemicals. Uh, they can uh, be regulated more by the countries themselves. So uh, this is, uh, again, a bureaucratic problem. Uh, everybody knows it's not good to have radioactive material in your drinking water. Uh, but how much, uh, that, that is... Um, zero base, health-based regulation. So there shouldn't be any, it should be zero. 
once you say, I can't operate at zero, then you get a, a kind of slippery system that says, well, make it as little as you possibly can. You know, lower it as far as you can. Or uh, they have what they call an ALARA policy, as low as reasonably achievable. So it's an acronym. Well, as low as reasonably achievable doesn't hold up in a court. So if you tried to take them to court on how much was in your drinking water, you couldn't say it should be ALARA, and they didn't go low enough because they could say it's impossible. So it's, it's not uh, something you can litigate on. And so they set a, a level which is rather high from a public health standpoint and say, well, uh, this is the maximum permissible level. It's not a safe level. Maximum permissible level means everybody agrees that above this level it's hazardous, but then they disagree below at where it should be. But when it comes to a court case uh, for, say, cancer or death or uh, anything that happens, uh, you, you use that maximum permissible level, not zero. <laughs> so it's, it's a very complex legal problem. And it's the uh, living things around the lakes and the rivers that suffer because uh, they can actually operate right up to the maximum permissible level legally. And if anyone uh, gets cancer or dies, uh, that is a permissible level and that's just an acceptable um, negative effect. It's something like collateral damage in the military. Uh, you know, you just killed a few people, but you didn't intend to. So this kind of, this is very difficult to deal with. And uh, people really have little or no uh, legal recourse to what's happening to our, to our water and to our food supply. Water is something God-given right. We have a, a natural or uh, human right to water, and animals and plants have a right to water.